إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي لا فلا مضل وما يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Praises belong to Allah We praise Him We seek His forgiveness from the evil of our own souls and our bad deeds Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide And I bear witness that Allah is one bearing no partner And that Prophet Muhammad is his final messenger Allah says in the third chapter of the Quran, verse 103 <laughs> She roughly translates as O you who believe, fear Allah as you should be feared and die not except in a state of Islam. Uh, my dear respected brothers and sisters, today is a very, uh, very, very uh, emotional uh, time for me because this is going to be my last khutbah ever in the University of Nottingham. And I'm finishing off my course. So I, I was very, very surprised that the time has flown so fast that uh, it's not time to say goodbye to all my beautiful brothers and sisters and the Islamic society. So I wanted to mention that in the, in the onset. And I was very confused as to what should I talk about in today's khutbah. And the thing that I came with was about three things. Inshallah, these three things were the most important experiences for me personally in my life towards coming towards Islam, towards being a part of a, a brotherhood or a sisterhood you know, the Islamic family, right? And inshallah, I hope that all the experiences that I, I, I've shared with you, they can help you to become better Muslims than me, better Muslims than me, and better Muslims than me, inshallah. So the first thing that I wanted to, to really, really uh, point out is the importance of companionship. You know, this aspect of a brotherhood and sisterhood, I think, is one of the key fundamentals of, of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, when he went into Medina, the first major step that he did was create a mosque. So he first created the masjid, right? That was the first biggest thing that he, he ever did. Right after that, he did something called the mu'asa which is when he paired up all the people of Mecca with Medina. So he officialized a brotherhood and a sisterhood. So you had companions who were tied with you. And I think this is a very fundamental aspect of Islam, the idea of having a strong sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, just to show you, mashallah, the, the depth of the Arabic language, you know you hear our brothers and sisters or our British brothers when they say Aki, which is actually Akhi in Arabic, right? That word, where does it come from? If you look at the lexicons of the Islamic dictionaries, the word Akhi comes from the word Akhiya, which is a Yemeni dialect, right? And it was used to refer to a stick, which you put into the ground, and then you tie a rope around that stick. And then the other end of that rope, you tie it to either a camel or a horse. And the analogy is, is that the animal and his akhiyah is like the brother and his brotherhood or the sister and her sisterhood without that akhiyah the animal will just go straight right so this is the importance of tying your akhiyah to the right stable as muslims obviously we have a bigger family we have the humanity uh, the brothers of humanity and sisters of humanity but within that we also have brothers of islam brothers of, uh, of, of, of uh, the deen of allah right and we obviously share some things which non-Muslims don't share with us. As Muslims, we have duties upon us, for example, encouraging other, the other person to pray five times a day, right? I mean, you're not going to go up to a non-Muslim, brother, I'm going to pray, please pray with me. Actually, please be the imam. No, it's not going to happen, right? That's the fundamental joining hood of brotherhood and sisterhood. And subhanAllah, our seerah and our history of Islam is filled with amazing, beautiful stories of how the brothers were tight, how the sisters were tight in Islam. And for me personally, I really like the, the funny aspects, uh, the funny stories. So for me, one of the most amazing companions is Naaman, which I think I've, I've shared many stories with before. And I came across a new one recently. Now, uh, Naaman was, if you imagine, he's like the joker. Out of all the Sahaba, you have the serious type, you have the, you know, the very wise type. <laughs> Naaman was like the very funny type of the, of the companions. And um, so he went to the souk, okay, he went to the souk, and he goes to, to the guy, you know, I want to buy some meat for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? 
And so the, the souk guy, he thinks, okay, fine, no problem. And the Nu'man said, we'll pay you later, don't worry about it, inshallah. So the guy, he gave uh, the meat to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, this is charity from Nu'man, okay? Now, Nu'man, you know, he watches the Prophet ﷺ eat and then he goes to the Prophet, Prophet ﷺ, you need to pay the man. The Prophet's like, what, what happened? I thought this was a charity from, from you to me. Like, yes, I wanted to put charity on your face by giving you food and making you smile. But now you have to pay for it. <laughs> so this is one of the you know, funny qualities of uh, Na'ima. And there are many other stories. You can find them, inshallah, in your, in your books and your literature. But um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about is that it's, it's, a, it's a natural thing. It's, it's a very natural thing. It's, it, it's, it's an existent phenomenon of the Muslim Ummah that we are uh, a little bit conflicted within ourselves. We do have, obviously, a lot of divisions. And I think that's something which we need to really try to tackle headlong, inshallah, and try to really overlook. In the, in the hadiths, we find evidences where even the Sahaba, they differed. Over small things, they differed, right? But they didn't let that difference overtake the ultimate priority of being in Jama'ah, of being a Muslim community. A very prime example is the story of Banu Najd. So you know the Prophet Sallallahu he had a major battle where the the, 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 the ditch, there was a ditch there, right? And they, you know, you know what happened afterwards. And then Angel Gabriel, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he said then, you need to go to the, the people of Banu Najd. And so the Prophet decided to go there on the command of Angel uh, Jibreel Alaihi Salaam. And before he did, he told his companions, it's a very vague command, he told, he told his companions, by the time you get to Banu Najd, Pray us, okay? Pray us. And the companions listened, no problem. So the Prophet, he left headlong. He left early. He had to go. Now the companions, they went up after him. And the companions, they had ikhtilaf amongst themselves. They had ikhtilaf. They differed. One group of people thought that the Prophet mentioned that we have to pray when we reach Badunaj, when we reach that place, right? The other group of people, they realized that Asr time is closing down. We're going to miss Asr if we, by the time we get there. So we have to pray now along the journey. So you have two opinions now. One opinion followed the Prophet ﷺ literally. And the other group, they took the context into consideration. Okay? And so there's ikhtilaf amongst the, the scholars, uh, amongst the Sahaba. Now, one group, they prayed on the journey. And one group, when they went towards Badunaj, then they prayed. And here's the beautiful part. When they both went up to the Prophet ﷺ, who's right, he mentioned both of you are right. Both of the groups are right. Both have valid opinions. So subhanAllah, and this, and this was never a means of divi uh, in a division amongst Ummah. It was just a difference in opinion. And I think as, as, as brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that, yes, of course, we're going to have difference in opinions. But don't let, let that take over the bigger picture of just keeping the, the jama'ah. It's very, very important. You know? You recite one surah at least 17 times a day because of your five prayers. <coughs> surah Fatiha, right? Now, an interesting question is, in the Surah Fatiha, you said, Ihdina Surat al-Mustaqeem. You said, guide us to the straight path. Now, you know that Salah is an individual prayer between you and Allah. So why are you saying us? <coughs> and mashallah, the tafsir says, it's because the jama'ah of the, of the ummah is more important than the individual action. It has to be a collective effort. SubhanAllah. That it's a collective effort. Right? Another thing that we need to keep in consideration is obviously brothers and sisters, they have different circumstances. I'm not talking about theological differences, no? just different circumstances. And obviously when we become more practicing, there are other people who need our help and we need to be able to be very emotionally intelligent to bring them into Islam. Right? So there's a very, and this is a very interesting hadith, I found it very interesting, I think it's in Bukhari. And two people, they went up towards the Prophet Wasallam, And they, they both asked the same question. It was Ramadan time, it was Ramadan time, okay? And they asked the Prophet, is it okay if we just kiss our wives you know, on the forehead? Is it okay? Is it halal? The Prophet Wasallam said one, he said to one, no. And to the other one, he said yes. This is very interesting. Why did he say yes to one and no to the other? And the, he explained that the first one he said no to, he was a young guy. Okay? And it's, very, it's, it's a natural thing that in young men, the, the desire is a bit stronger. right? And he knows that if he kisses here, it might lead to him breaking his fast. So he said no to him. right? 
For the other guy, he was a little bit older, actually much more older. And the Prophet realized that at that age, he probably is not as strong. So he said, it's fine, no problem. So the Prophet ﷺ took people's background and circumstances into content. For the same scenario, he gave two fatwas. For the same scenario, two fatwas. Just like that, when we, inshallah, as brothers and sisters, we as brothers and sisters, when we talk to other, our own brothers and sisters, we have to keep in mind about their context, about their circumstances. You know, I, one of the things, I've, I've been here for three and a half years in the Islamic society. One of the things I feel most blessed about, about the Islamic society in Nottingham, is that, mashallah, we've had so many brothers and sisters who have come from a very bad background into Islam because people have been kind to them. They've learned to adapt to their circumstances and help them in Islam, you know? And personally, personally, I'm telling you, I was one of the examples. I'm only here, I'm only on this platform because of one brother, Brother Hanin Shiwan, right? And this brother, when I first, when I first came to Nottingham, I was not, let's just, I was in Jahiliya days, you can just imagine that, Jahiliya days, right? And so when I came to Nottingham, right, I, I hated, I, I, I didn't want to be with the mullahs or the masjid or the brothers, etc. But the brother, you know, he spoke to me about games and music and stuff like that. And subhanAllah, he got me hooked, you know? And this brother, he's a practicing brother. So he took me to my very first Jum'ah in the ISO. He took me to my very first Jum'ah in the ISO. And because of that, SubhanAllah, I feel so blessed. Just that one thing, I've been, been able to be so blessed that I got, so, I got to meet so many amazing brothers and sisters. I learned so much about Islam just because of that one thing he did for me. He took my background into consideration, but he didn't make me feel I was worse than him. He made me feel I was equal to him. Right? There's a saying that when you walk, when you, when you talk to your brothers and sisters, don't walk on top of them, walk with them. The sirat, you know the sirat which we keep talking about? One of the linguistic implications, it's a very wide road. You can encompass as many people as you want, right? And the final point that I want to conclude, especially on the topic of companionship, is that the story of Umar al Khattab when he was Khalifa, now there was a man in the time of Umar al-Khattab who was very, um, he was a very good, he was a diligent Muslim, you know, he was, he was the, he recited the Qur'an, he knew the Qur'an by heart, he was a fuqaha, he was, um, he was, he went up, he said, he did very on top, on form, so one of the best Muslims you could ever see, right? And, but he had one problem, he used to drink, he used to drink a lot, okay? So much so that it was very rare to find him when he was not drunk, okay? That's how much he can. Now, Umar al-Khattab, you know, being Umar al-Khattab, being the tough guy that you know he is, being the tough guy, look how he handled the situation. He, he, really, he felt very upset about this brother, so he wrote him a letter, and I'm just paraphrasing, you can find it in your Sira books. I, I, he basically mentioned that, you know, we love you for the sake of Allah. We love you for the sake of Allah. Please get rid of this one bad deed which is dragging you down. This is one, I'm just paraphrasing slowly. And then he sealed the letter, Umar al-Khattab, he sealed this letter and then he told all the companions around him, please make dua for this one brother, please make dua for this one brother, right? And subhanAllah, Umar al-Khattab then got a messenger and said to him, I want you to give him this letter when, when he is sober, i.e. he is not drunk. So the, compa- the messenger, he went towards the, this companion and he waited until he was a little bit okay and he gave him the letter. The companion, when he, when he read the letter, he felt so much love of Umar al-Khattab in his heart. He started crying. And he, he vowed, he promised himself, I would never drink again. He would never, and he never drank again after that. And subhanAllah, Umar al-Khattab said after this incident, that don't push your brothers and sisters into the arms of shaitan. Don't push your brothers and sisters into the arms of shaitan. Everybody has their downfalls. You just got to use the right hikmah to bring them back in, inshallah, right? So this is just the first thing which I want to touch upon on the idea of companionship. The last, the second thing which I want to talk about is, and this is, this is, this is especially to those brothers who keep themselves at a distance from the Islamic society or distant from Islam or distant from just generally anything to do with Muslim brothers and sisters. You have to understand that uh, there's a very good expression in Islam that every saint has a past, And every sinner has a future, right? Just because you think you're so far away from Islam does not make you a bad Muslim. You sin. The fact that you have air in your lungs means that Allah has given you another second to improve, to get closer to Him, right? 
Umar Khattab, you, this, is, this is one of the most amazing stories. Umar Khattab, he was going to kill the Prophet He is now buried with the Prophet I'll say that again. He was going to kill the Prophet I.e. the worst thing you could do to the Prophet. And now he's buried with him. What does that tell you? That everyone has a chance to move, to motivate. Now, I want to share with you my personal stories, right? I wasn't practicing at all. Four, five, four years ago, I didn't know what Subhanallah meant, I didn't know what Bismillah meant, I didn't know what Alhamdulillah, nothing. I didn't know nothing, right? I didn't even know what the um, La ilaha illallah, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know what Arabic was, right? I was just like, just, you know, do your automated salah, khalas, that's it. That's it, end of story, right? But I want to tell you that if you want to make that step, it starts from you. It starts from you. Now, I'll just tell you, and I, and I know you cannot judge my intention, but I'm here for the sake of Allah, just to tell you from my first experience, inshallah, which, from which you can learn from, inshallah, right? When I was in my GCSE, sorry, A-levels, and we were applying for universities, right? Now, I was the sort of person who loved computer graphics, I wanted to draw things, etc., you know, like players and all that sort of stuff. Now, the problem was, my mom, she came up to me, and she said to me, Shai, there might be a problem in Islam, you know, their scholars did disagree whether drawing living things is haram, halal, so on and so forth. This is, again, a theological problem, right? And I was like, oh man, I really wanted to do computer graphics. So I looked at my A-level grades, and I was just, I, I, I was good at chemistry and math, right? And I said, khalas, chemistry and math, chemical engineering, that's it. That's the only reason why I chose chemical engineering. And subhanAllah, to my surprise, there's no chemistry in chemical engineering. <laughs> there's no chemistry, there's no physics and math. So, and then subhanAllah, so I took a step. I maybe had maybe a drop of Iman that day in my heart, a drop of Iman, and I took a step. I wasn't practicing then, I, wasn't, I didn't even care about Islam, but maybe that one thing was troubling me a bit. But the, the thing that came into my mind was, you know, when I have a family, I don't want my family to live off haram means, etc. Those were sort of thoughts that were coming into my mind. And then my mom, she said something very, very important to me. And I think like, subhanAllah, I think that was the, the seeding point for Islam for me. My mom said to me, Shai, you did something to, to, A, first of all, to keep your mother happy. My mom, she's like super religious, you know, so in the day she found the mother's like super religious, right? So she was like, subhanAllah, you did something to keep your mom happy and then also to make Allah happy. And he will give you something which you would never ever expect, right? Now for me, when I was in that station, I always thought I was going to do PhD. I always knew I wanted to be a professor, etc. Now, again, I'm not boasting about myself. I couldn't care less about these things. I'm just telling you about his plan, right? As soon as I came into university, as soon as I came into university, I was at Bath before. I was at Bath for three years. I got two scholarships from the University of Bath. I came first in my class. And bear in mind, I had no interest in chemical engineering. No interest, right? I got first class. And then I got a fully funded PhD from the University of Nottingham, right? But the thing is, my mom, she made a dua that Allah will give you something you never ever expected. Right? Never expected. I always expected these things, but I never, the, the, the thing that I didn't expect was Islam entering my heart. I was the sort of person who I thought, khalas, you know, maybe when I get married, I'll let my wife be the Muslim, inshallah, she can pray double rakah for everything for me. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of thing I wanted to do. <laughs> you know? So subhanAllah, Allah, because of her dua, I feel that I am, I am where I am now. Because of her dua. But the thing that I wanted to mention, especially to those, those people who keep themselves at a distance from Aysal, or from brothers and sisters, or those of you who know who are in that position and not even here in Jum'ah, tell them, there's a hadith. There's a very beautiful hadith. It says that if you take one step towards Allah, He comes walking towards you. If you walk towards Allah, He comes running towards you. But the key thing is what? You have to take the first step. You've got to take the first step. Musa alayhi salam, when he wanted to raise the seeds, he had to put the stick into the ground. The effort had to first come from him. Maryam alayhi salam, when she was giving birth to Isa alayhi salam, right? She had to shake the tree before the birth was made easy. You've got to make that start. If you don't, then you'll always be in that negative position. Oh, I'm not good enough, so on and so forth. But if you take that step sincerely for the sake of Allah, you will go places which you thought Allah would never be able to take you. Right? So to wrap up the first part of the khutbah, one, companionship is very important. Right? It's very natural to have differences. But do not, do not overlook the bigger picture of the jama'ah for these minor differences. Number two, 
If you want to really become a practicing Muslim, and, and I'm not, I actually don't like the word practicing, if you want to become a sincere Muslim, a sincere Muslim, start taking the first step. And you will see what Allah does for you. You know, the, in Discover Islam week, Alhamdulillah, this is, I, I don't know if anyone knows about this, we had a brother who came into Islam because all the efforts of the brothers and sisters here. We had a brother who came into Islam. You know, he, he believed everything, mashallah. He believed everything. You know what his concern was? What would my family say? What would my friends say? Oh, my job, so and so forth. He believed everything, but he was afraid. What would people say? Right? Now, the thing is, I told him, bro, take the first step. Take the first step, and you see where you'll go. And subhanAllah, he did it. And now, mashallah, he's surrounded by brothers and sisters, and they're helping him out, inshallah. Don't underestimate the power of Allah. Never ever think you're worse than Allah's mercy. And Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. My final advice, inshallah, and in the sit of this thing, the khutbah, inshallah. The key thing that personally, you know, in Islam, there are many different studies that you can have. You can have the study of hadith, you can have the study of fiqh, the seerah, so on and so forth. The thing that attracted me uh, most is toward Islam is the seerah, the Quran. The Quran is for me the most beautiful inspiration that exists in the world. SubhanAllah, it's the most amazing. And I really want you guys to really try and push as hard as you can to really engage with the Book of Allah, right? Allah keeps telling us to go reflect, to go think. You know? Do you not think, do you not contemplate over the Book of Allah, right? And the, the, the Book of Allah is very holistic. It's not just deen, 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 deen. It has, a load, it has loads of other subjects that exist within it. I'll give you three examples, right? For those of you who are science, I'm, I'm guessing Muslims, yani 50% are engineers already. So, a lot of you guys are interested in science. We have science in the Quran, right? Um, I'm not talking about the miracles, I'm talking about things people were inspired from from the Quran. There are, there's a thing, I think an Egyptian team, uh, uh, a group of engineers and scientists, I think there's one scholar in there as well, where they found uh, some amazing inspiration from the Quran and now they're trying to do research on it. You know in Surah Al-Kahf, Surah number 18, where Allah talks about Dhul uh, name, uh, right? And he builds this wall for Yajul Mawjud. Now one of the words that he found out is a mixture of several different materials. And now they found out that this material is one of the strongest materials in the world. They actually tested this physically, and it's one of the strongest materials in the world. Another study that's being done is, you know the story of Yusuf alayhi salam? On a, in a nutshell level, Yusuf, he gave his shirt to, to, for his blind father, right? And because of that, the blind father lost, uh, he, he was cured from his blindness. And so from this one researcher, he figured out there might be something in sweat, because Yusuf a.s. sweat was in the, in the jumper, the sweat, right? And subhanAllah, they found that there are traces of elements inside your sweat that can cure blindness. This is inspiration from the Quran. Imagine, this is science. And the inspiration is where? The Book of Allah. I'm not making this up. There's another um, very interesting study where they, you know music, so where they, play, they, they put um, music uh, underwater, right? And they played all sorts of music and nothing happened, right? But when they played the Quran, apparently these crystal structures appeared in the water. Crystal structures appear. Check it out, I'm not making this, check it out. This is science in the Quran, right? Number two, if, you, if some of you are interested in sociology, psychology, so on and so forth, I'll give you one example of some of these elements which exist in the Book of Allah. You know, many people think that the book is irrelevant to us. But the book has generic concepts which are timeless for us. In Surah Al-Baqarah, it's a very small verse. It's one, one, actually, it's a big verse in the, within the context of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is the incident where, you know, you had two angels come to Babylon. And they taught people black magic. And this was a means of test. This, Allah was not trying to punish the people. It was a test. It was just a test. He wanted to test the people how they would do, right? And obviously some people, they were corrupt, and they used the black magic which the angels taught them to ruin the society. And it says that the society went flop, essentially. It went flop. And you know what was the first cause of the ruining of the society? What was the first cause? Is that they used the black magic to separate man and wife. The first cause of ruining a society starts with husband and wife. And we know this even from the hadith. This is one of the theories they mentioned. Uh, there's a hadith which says, Iblis, he is at the front in his throne. He's in his throne. 
And all the shayateen, they come towards him. One shayateen says to him, I made a man kill someone. Another shayateen says, I made him steal something. But then another shayateen says, I separated husband and wife. You know what the Iblis does? He claps around and puts him on his throne. Subhan, this is what? One small thing. And you have sociological lessons from there. Right? If you want to learn family dynamics, if you have good kids and bad kids, look at the story of Yaqub. If you have very bad kids, look at the story of Noah. If you have, you know, well, any family dynamics, you can find the Quran. But the most important, and I, this is why I highly recommend everyone here put a lot of emphasis in learning Arabic, and especially teaching your kids Arabic at a very early age. The linguistic miracle of Allah is absolutely phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. I'll share one last thing before we conclude to this khutbah. You know the very last surah, and I specifically chose this because I think everybody should know this. Right? This is what the Surah says. So you're asking Allah to seek protection, right? Uh, you know, and you're basically saying, Min from the shar, from the evil and the whispers of the khannas. You're asking Allah for protection, right? Now, khannas, khannas, actually means you know the stars when you see twinkle, it goes black and white, black and white. That's a twinkle. That's khannas, right? The shaitan, and it talks about sudur. Sudur means your chest, right? Sudur means your chest. It doesn't mention heart. It doesn't mention qalb. Sudur in that. means the chest of man. And, and the seers the mentioned, why did Allah mention chest here? It's related to the word khannas. Khannas means the one who goes and then retreats. Just like the twinkle in the star. It goes and comes back. Goes and comes back. The shaitan, his job is just to come and whisper, right? Imagine that you have a house and, a, and a, like a, a garden around it. His job is to keep coming back in and out of the garden. But it is you who lets it into the house. <coughs> SubhanAllah. This is one of the linguistic miracles of the Quran. Look at the subtle beauty, beauty of the Quran. And my, the, the point that I w- I'm trying to establish is that the book of Allah is irreplaceable. Irreplaceable and unchangeable. If you really want to be inspired, if you want to find a purpose, you can find your degrees inside the book of Allah. You can find everything you need to teach and become the best Muslim that you want to be. Right? Many of you here are going to be fathers, mothers. You're, you're, some of you already are. Right? The question is, how central have you made the Quran in your life? How centralized is it? And inshallah, that is my final advice to all of you, inshallah. May Allah make all of us, all of us, Best ambassadors of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah open our hearts to the Qur'an. May Allah open our minds to be able to reflect and engage in the Qur'an. May Allah make us the best example for the dunya, for all the people around us. And may Allah to be inspired by this book of Allah to such an extent that we're not just successful in this life, but also the next life. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa ala ali اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك عبد الجليل رب العالمين في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار وقنا الصلاه